All right, we're going to be going over that review, that beast of a review you had on quizzes. Uh, this is the quizzes review. Question number one, what function has a remainder of 19 when divided by x plus 2? Use substitution. Switch the sign. And test it into one of these functions. Okay, that gives you a remainder of 27. Your output is always going to be a remainder. So which one is the right answer? You can pause it and try it on your own. And if you unpause it, I'll have them all available for you. Okay, I have all the answers. So my substitution gives me 27, 19, negative 3, and 3. The output is going to be your remainder. So I'm looking for 19. And that's going to be on the one that says x squared minus 4x plus 7. So it's going to be this one. Okay, um, so for question two, it's talking about which one's a, uh, it's a factor. We want to determine if it's a factor. The remainder has to be equal to zero if an expression is a factor of a polynomial. So we look for substitution again, and we see what that remainder is. This will only have to plug in one number one time. So two to the three minus three times two squared minus 2 times 2 minus 8. Gives me a remainder of negative 16. So since it's 0, since it's not 0, it's not going to be a factor. So we'd say no, the remainder is negative 16. OK, this question here is talking about what is the remainder. So it's very similar to the last one. We want to just go through and plug in the opposite of that expression, so 2 parentheses negative 3 to the fourth minus 9 parentheses negative 3 squared plus 10 parentheses negative 3 minus 20. And that remainder gives me 31. 31. So that would just be a numeric input. 31. This one, for the polynomial function, 4x minus 2, x plus 1, 2x minus 5, what is the sum of all the zeros? Add. So you can get the zeros by switching those signs. So x is going to be 2, x equals negative 1. And then you can solve this for 0. And 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. So if you add those together, that's 2 minus 1 plus 2.5. That should give you 3.5. Oops. You can also get the zeros from the graph. And if you put that in Desmos, negative 1, 2, and 2.5 back up our answers here. All right, question 5. All right, this one's talking about um, a table of values. Which statement best describes when these two functions equal each other? Well, if you look at these two values, the output, for all the inputs, the output for p of x is consistently higher. Until right there. So they kind of switch places. So if you were to plot those two points, OK, so I went ahead and plotted them so you could get a better visual. Um, as you can see, if I plotted the, um, the function that's p of x, you're going to notice that it kind of follows a line. And then the q of x is more of a exponential. And you can see that right here between 4 and 5, these graphs kind of overtake each other. So you see how these kind of switch places, which one's higher? 
it's between four and five, that's going to be when, um, when they equal each other. All right, next question. Uh, which of the following end behaviors are true? Well, we'll just write the end behaviors since they're not listed here. Let me go ahead and graph it, graph it on Desmos. Okay, when you graph this on Desmos, it uh, opens up on the left and opens down on the right. So we say left, up, down, or right down. So typically how we write this is we would say as x goes to negative infinity, since this does not say y, it's p of x, we would say p of x goes to infinity. That's left and up. And then down here, you would say as x goes to infinity, p of x goes to negative infinity. That's right and down. So those are your end behaviors. All right, this question is just talking about which one of these functions is going to give you zeros at negative one, two, three, a y-intercept at negative six, and the, the following end behaviors, which is f of x is always gonna be your y. So that's gonna be up and that's left. And this is down and that's right. So we're looking for the graph to be up left and down on the right. So kind of similar to the last one that we had. All right, I'm gonna graph them and we'll see what we got. All right, I went ahead and graphed these on Desmos. Um, you can pause it and graph all four of these at once if you'd like, and we can talk about the characteristics. And what I like to do is just show one at a time so you can hide them, kind of make it a little bit easier. So the first one here has zeros at negative one, two, and three. Okay, that's good. But notice that it's y-intercepts actually at zero positive six. So that's not gonna work. So if you click on that, that hides it. We can open up and open the next one. This has zeros at negative three, negative two, and one, which is not the case. So we'll close that one out. This one has zeros at negative three, negative two, and one again. So it's gonna be this one, negative one, two, and three. It's got a y-intercept here, and it's got the following end behaviors, up and left, and down and right. So in this case, it'll be D. All right, increasing and decreasing intervals. Let's graph it. Pause the video, graph it. When you graph this, it's got a minimum at 4.5 comma 1.5, that's your vertex. So it's gonna increase anything after 4.5 and it's gonna decrease anything below 1.5 or anything below 1.5. So increasing interval is going to be 4.5 to infinity because we always use the x value. And then decreasing is going to be negative infinity to 4.5. Still use the x value. So since this one wanted to know increasing, it's going to be this one. Number nine, which function increases on the interval negative infinity to one, but decreases from one to infinity? All right, pause the video. Okay, so for this video here, or for this problem, we got, again, four answer choices. We'll start with A. Increases on the interval negative infinity to one. Well, this one's decreasing when it hits one, so. That's not it. All right, let's take a look at this. It increases from negative infinity to one, but then it keeps increasing. So it's actually increasing throughout the whole graph. So it's not gonna be that third power one. All right, this one starts increasing and then it hits one and then it decreases. So that's gonna fit that description there. So it's gonna be 
negative x minus 1 to the fourth power. Next question. All right. So for, in order for an expression to be a factor, it has to have a remainder of 0. What we want to do on this problem is we want to solve this for the 0. You can also say 0.5. In order for an expression to be a factor, its remainder is 0. So when you use substitution, we want that to give you 0. So I would put this into Desmos. And then we can solve that equation. So there's a couple approaches to this. So give me a second here, pause. OK, so if I go into Desmos and I plug in what I have, substituting that 1 half in for x, you're going to notice that there is a it's a C value. You can't really put C in here. C gives me an error. We can talk more about sliders if you want, but um, we can play around with the slider. Um, we want the remainder to be 0. So if C ends up being 1, see when I change that value C, that works too. You can also do this. You can get rid of that. And we can just call that X. And if you click on the 0, 1 is going to give you 0 there. Let me put that in. So it's going to be 1. All right, next question. OK, so this is a fundamental theorem of algebra question. This is where the honors test differs a little bit. First thing you want to do is set that equal to 0. Then you want to graph it. We're going to get the real zeros. This is a fourth power. So there are going to be four total zeros. Roots, solutions, zeros, all mean the same thing. All right, pause the video and graph it. As you resume, you're going to have As you resume, you're going to have negative 3 and 3 as your real zeros. So what we do is we use synthetic division, and we knock that down to a quadratic. Oh, look, there's no x cubed. So that's a 0x cubed, and there's no x. So you're going to have your real roots as 3 and negative 3, or plus and minus 3 if you want to write it simply. And you're going to do synthetic division. That's a minus 9. But we need to get this down to, this is your remainder. So we need to get this down to a quadratic. So we use the other one. And we do it again. And again, your remainder is 0. That's what we want. So this, if we have a quadratic. This is going to be 4x to the fourth to the second power plus 0x plus 1. And we're going to set that equal to 0 to get your complex solutions. Well, this is non-existent. So this is 4x squared plus 1 equals 0. All right, to solve these ones without the x in the middle, simply subtract the number on the right. And then divide. So x squared is going to be negative 1 over 4. And to solve a square root, you do a 
to square, you do a plus or minus square root to the right side. So it's going to be x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1 over 4. Remember that the square root of a negative has an i in it. In fact, the square root of negative 1 is i. And the square root of 4 is 2. So this is actually i over 2, plus or minus. So those are actually your complex zeros in this case, plus or minus i over 2. These are your real zeros, 3 and negative 3. So 3 So you have 3, negative 3, um, negative i over 2, and positive i over 2. All right, next question. I'm going to solve for all the, real, the solutions, real and complex of the polynomial equation. It's going to have that similar feel to it. You're going to want to add this. I'm having some glitches with my pen. Basically, add these two over here and get everything to the right side. 4x to the fourth minus 10x cubed minus 7 of 2x. And then if you add the 39x squared, All right, so get it equal to zero, put it into Desmos, find your real zeros. This one's peculiar because it only hits the x-axis once. Remember that the fundamental theorem of algebra states that if you have the degree of four, for example, then you need to have exactly four roots, including the multiplicities. But the, the i roots, the complex roots, come in pairs, so it's like a plus or minus deal. See, you can't have three complex or imaginary roots, because that's an odd number. So that means this three is a double root. It's going to see how it hits there, then turns around and comes back up. That's a double root multiplicity of two. So that three is going to be used twice. Double root. So what you're going to do is you're going to do 3 in synthetic division two times. And that's only four, so we're going to have to do the three twice here. Double roots means synthetic division twice. Okay, here's our quadratic. This is x squared minus 4x plus 6. OK, so once you get this as a quadratic, you're going to plug it into the quadratic formula, opposite of b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Um, so opposite of negative 4 is 4, plus or minus all that's going to be 16 minus 24. So that's actually going to be the square root of negative 8. And then 2 times 1 is 2. 
that's going to be 4 plus or minus i times the square root of 8 over 2. Now you can break down the square root of 8 to the square root of 4 times 2. And the square root of 4 is going to be 2. So that's actually going to be 4 plus or minus 2i square root of 2 over 2. And if you reduce the 4 divided by 2 and the 2 divided by 2, you're going to get 2 plus or minus i square root of 2. So there's two roots there, and the 3 is a double root. That gives you four roots altogether. Next question. Now, anytime you have a polynomial, um, the number of roots is always going to be equal to the degree. So if it's a quartic, it's going to have four roots, but you see it only hits the x-axis here. Um, so, you know, in this example here, if that's a cubic, this would have one real root, and it would have two complex, because they don't hit the x-axis. Together, that gives you three. In this case here, it has two real roots, but since it's a fourth degree, it's going to have x to the fourth power. It's also going to have two complex as well. So two real and two complex. All right, this one's tricky. So in this one here, it says, which polynomial in factor form could represent the graph picture? Well, I want you to think about your zeros. You only have three zeros, but this one's a double. But it's at negative 3. So that factor is going to be x plus 3. Since it's a double, it's going to be square. This one's a single root since it goes through it. So that's going to be x plus 1 since it's at negative 1. Then over here, this one's a little bit peculiar because it only goes, it goes through. It doesn't turn around, but it does kind of flatten. So I'll show you why, what that power should be on a graph here. All right, so I'm going to resume this recording here. If I only did x minus 3, it does fit a lot of the features. And I'm going to change my y-axis to be a little bit um, broader. So I'll go from negative. See, 100 to 100, and we'll count by tens. Just so you can see what's going on with that. It doesn't quite fit what this is wanting me to have because this is, it's going up and then it's going down, but there's this wiggle here that's just not existing here. And that's because that's actually got a multiplicity higher than one. So if you made that like a squared, well, and then it's, it's going in the wrong direction. Of, um, it's going up here, then down and up. So it turns out, if you make that a multiplicity of 3, and let me adjust my x-axis again, or my y-axis. I'm going to go from negative 1,000 to 1,000, and we'll count by 100. And we'll bump that up to, oops, all right, now, if you ignore the y-axis for a minute, you can see that it has a better shape, it has that little uh, squiggle there, so that means third power is our best choice for that one. Okay. All right. And two more. Which polynomial function gives the following roots real and complex? Well, I'll show you how to write one. Okay. Um, so 
first, this is going to be x minus 2. No big deal. Now, to write a polynomial, get rid of this i. You're going to take away the 3. And to get rid of the i, we square it, because i squared is equal to negative 1. So when we square both sides, that's going to be x squared minus 6x plus 9. You can double check that. That's x minus 3, x minus 3. x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. And if I square this side, well, i squared is negative 1, so this actually is going to become negative 1. And the square root of 5 squared, the square and a square root cancel, so that's going to be 5. So this is x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals negative 5. So bring this over here and add it. Nine plus five is 14. Now you have the quadratic from that root. So you can go back and you can multiply it. So I'll let you finish that, but use the box method or distributing and multiply all this stuff together. Combine your like terms. I promise my writing is better. This pen is just acting up. So you're going to multiply, combine like terms, um, and you'll get your ex uh, simplified expression. All right, last question. Long division, long division. All right, for this one, I'm going paper and pencil since my um, computer pen's acting up. This one's a little bit different than the one that's on the screen, but it's very similar. So with long division, you want to look at the first terms and see how much this can be multiplied, what you can multiply by this to get that. So what times x squared is 3x to the fourth? Well, that'll be 3x squared. Um, so we're going to multiply that by the x squared. That's going to give you 3x to the fourth. And there's a missing term in here. It's like 0x. So we actually don't have an x cubed. But if you do 3x times negative 1, that's going to be negative 3x squared. See, I'm lining those up. So if I subtract those, those cancel out. And then, well, this doesn't have anything to subtract from it, so it's going to be 2x to the third power. When I subtract the negative, that's adding. So that's negative 2 plus 3, which is going to be plus 1 squared. And we'll bring down the minus 4x. Do it again. So we look at, all right, what can I multiply x squared by to get 2x to the third power? And that's going to be 2x. So now I distribute that to what's out here. So it's going to be 2x cubed. Again, there is no middle term, so I'm just going to leave that blank. 2x times negative 1 is negative 2x. subtract. Um, nothing to subtract here, so that's going to be 1x squared. And if I take away a negative again, that's adding, so that's going to be minus 2x. And I finally bring down the 7. Let me do this one more time. What times x squared is 1x squared? That's going to be 1. Multiply, so it's going to be 1x squared, no middle term, so we'll leave that blank. And 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. And when we subtract, cancel, you have left over here. 
That's negative 2x and negative 7 minus negative 1. Once again, is adding, so 7 and 1 is 8. And this is all your remainder. So your answer is going to be your remainder over your divisor. 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus your remainder over your divisor.